Chief Chief Officer and my friend, Dr. Becky Farley. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Make sure you turn your computer on loud because I want you to be able to hear. I just remembered to do that on my own. So um, thank you, Glenn, for that introduction. And I love your new space. I want to come work out with you when I'm visiting. <laughs> it looks marvelous. Anytime, um, anytime Becky, anytime. <laughs> yeah, it looks great. So um, well, thank you all so much for being here. This talk is for you. And um, I'm gonna move that little sound out of the way. Um, I'm gonna talk about exercise as medicine, but I wanted to just first um, make sure you all knew out there in Hawaii that the WPC, the World Parkinson's Congress, is gonna be held in Phoenix, Arizona in 2026 in May, the end of May. And I'm on the planning committee, so we have, we got our official slides, so I get to start announcing it everywhere I go. Um, if you have never been to a World Parkinson's Congress, it is it is a conference that's international for famous all the movement disorders doctors, for all the allied health professionals and nurses and and uh, psychologists, for people with Parkinson's. So. They have, um, it's an opportunity for you to interact with all those professionals and learn from them. And they have activities for you all day from eight to six. So you have your own track or you can go into any of the other talks and it is phenomenal and life-changing for me. And I think um, it gives you lots of contacts and information. So think about it. And then if you are younger onset, so Glenn, I, um, I can send you these slides actually, but they're having the first um, Young Onset Parkinson's Conference. And it's three webinars a day, I think for those three days. But just in case you don't know about it, it is free and it is, uh, I'm sure gonna be top quality. So that is for you all to see. Um, I and then- uh, I registered for that too, Dr. Farley. Pardon? I registered for it already, Becky. Oh, yeah. good, good. I mean, tell me how it is. I'm sure to be great. Um, and then am I able to change my slides, um, Kai? Let's see. Yes, you should be able to change your. Okay. Well. Hmm. I'm not able to get it to change. Let's see. Oh, I found, okay, got it. I found the right computer to click on. So this is what I want to talk about today is exercise as medicine for people with Parkinson's. Um, 20 years ago, those words were not even being used. So there's been this huge exercise revolution and, um, I've been involved, um, I was lucky enough to be starting my postdoc when this exercise revolution in Parkinson's was starting. And so it did drive my career. Um, I decided I wanted to go into the community and not stay in academia. And I wanted to be able to develop some new paradigms. Um, and so I'm right now I'm sitting in our power gym in Tucson, Arizona, and it's a fitness center and we have rehab and we have exercise going on all day. And so we're able to provide all these wonderful services under one roof. And um, it's a very wonderful job. And I think in the future, you really, everyone needs exercise as medicine, but you also need access to healthcare. So this way you can get it in one place and make it more convenient. So I'm going to talk about I'm not going to give you a bunch of studies. I'm just going to summarize with these illustrations, like what does exercise as medicine mean? And um, try to give you some ideas of, uh, I'll just summarize some of the key points about uh, if exercise is medicine, that means you need a prescription, right? So 
we'll talk about that at the end. I have a sample prescription from you that one of our gym members prepared, and it's really fun to go and explain how he put it together. So, okay. So really, I wish I could just sell medicine exercise as a pill, right? Like everything else. So this is a fun idea for what, what, what would you choose, right? How many do you want to take? How many pills? Maybe you want a variety of different pills. So um, I put one of my favorite uh, pills on there. So I really believe in high intensity functional training, for instance, because you get the best of both worlds. You get high intensity, your heart rate goes up and you get functional skill training, which is complex, right? Your everyday movement is pretty complex. And that both of those are really um, the bottom line. That's what people need. You need to have that complex movement. You need to have that high rate heart rate. Um, and all these other things have actually been studied in Parkinson's as well. Um, and pretty much anything people do, you get better at. So you want to do things that are going to improve your everyday life, right? Like, I mean, it's great to learn Tai Chi, but are you going to do, does that Tai Chi help you when you go to reach in a cabinet and squat down and pick something up? Um, because we know that it is your everyday life where the biggest problems with movements occur in Parkinson's. Um, that automaticity of just sort of doing automatic things that you don't think about. That's what we want to sustain for as long as possible. So um, that's, I'm going to talk about some of the justification for exercise as medicine and what does it mean? So this is an, ex, this is just an illustration to show you how many research studies there have been since 1990. So I started my postdoc in 2000. And the blue, those are, that's the blue articles there. Um, and when I was trying to write a grant to do the LSCT big, um, there was no studies. The 10 years before, I could hardly find a single study on exercise. Um, most of the studies were about yoga and stretching, not about vigorous exercise at all. And so you can see that between 2000 and 2010, this area here, the blue, people started uh, looking at exercise in animals. And so the animal research just went crazy. I even published an article that summarized all the animal research because I was so excited about it. Um, and there were just a few number of trials about doing those same types of exercise. Oops, sorry about that. Um, sorry, I don't know. I must have vibrated the table with my excitement. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so then in 2010, they started translating all that animal research to humans and look how, how many clinical trials and randomized clinical trials there are now. Um, in fact, they have so many studies that they are doing what's called a, a meta-analysis or a systematic review when they pull like 50, 70 articles on some particular question they want to answer like, um, what what exercise do I need to do for my balance? And then they put all the balance studies together and they come up with the, the answer. And these kind of studies are extremely informative. It's like wonderful, like because they really try to pull out the important ingredients that are in all these thousands of articles. So that's where we are today. And um, I cannot tell you how much it's changing the field of Parkinson's. You should feel very blessed because Parkinson's today is not like yesterday. There are so many more resources. There is so much more information about what you can do and how you can be proactive and take control um, You know, while you're waiting on the cure, right? Exercise can make a difference, not only on your body, but your brain. And I hope I convince you of that. So, um, so this is an example of all the different things that exercise has been shown to benefit, to do for you. Some of it is like, well, it reduces your motor symptoms. Well, that's amazing, right? Like if you exercise regularly, 
maybe you don't have to take so many medications. And if you look over there on that blue circle on the opposite side, it says improved drug effect efficacy. That means, yes, there is data now that shows people don't need as many medications if they exercise regularly. You also can improve your non-motor symptoms down there toward the bottom. I don't have an arrow that you can really see, but um, the non-motor symptoms like your sleep, your mood, your your problem solving parts of your brain, your executive function, those get better, those, those processes, those skills, those cognitive skills. You get really better at what you practice. So task specific improvement. So if you wanna learn how to turn, you can get better at turning. I might have time to show you that before we um, close today, but I do wanna be able to ask, answer your questions. Or maybe you want to learn how to play some game with your grandchild or do something with your partner. You can get better if you practice that skill and practice it, um, uh, that task. You, your quality of life can improve as well as there's reduced disability. So all of these things have been shown in the research. Now you might see the word prevention and I'm going to show you how um, well, what, what does it look like if exercise improves you physically and cognitively, emotionally, and it might prevent disease in people that are, you know, young, if they keep exercising, or if they um, are in those early prodromal stages of Parkinson's, and it may also be disease modifying, meaning it may slow the disease. And I want today, when we're done today, I hope you understand what that means. And, you know, what's the difference between disease modifying and just simply improved symptoms, improved motor and non-motor symptoms? Because that's also really important. I mean, if you can live 10 years with not as severe symptoms, well, that's a lot. And maybe it's also potentially slowing the disease itself. They're kind of two different things. So, um, so there you go. That's like, I could stop right now because I hope that's convincing of why you need to exercise. And I don't want you to be fearful of what exercise is. Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little more. What does it mean? Um, this slide is just to show you that when this concept of exercise-induced neuroplasticity means that when you exercise, however that is, and we'll talk about it, it changes your brain. Your brain is always changing. It's always adapting to what you're doing. But some of those brain changes that they have documented in animals and now humans may also trigger in um, uh, not only trigger brain health, but they may uh, contribute to uh, improving the disease. So they target those disease mechanisms that make those dopamine neurons die. For instance, um, they have evidence that um, they're, the mitochondria and those cells get better. So the cells live longer, those dopamine neurons, as well as other neurons in the brain. Um, there's less inflammation in those in that part of the brain where the Parkinson's cells are dying. There's um, neurotrophic factors that are floating around and helping cells thrive and grow and, and even change the structure of your brain. There's now evidence in humans there is less brain atrophy in people that are exercising. Amazing. So this is... Um, it's been shown in animals. We've, they, we've known about that in animals for, you know, since 2000 and before 2010. But now they're looking in the brains of humans and they're looking for the same things and they're finding many of those things. So, so there's brain and body changes. So that was my motivation for starting a nonprofit back in 2010 when I started PWR or POWER. And so that's why we have this gym in Tucson. It used to be about the only gym in the US or the world. And now we've trained, we have trained over 7,000 occupational and physical therapists. 
and fitness professionals so that they can go out and learn how to do this kind of uh, program. And we have a virtual experience you can, that people can take advantage of. And then we have a retreat. So I welcome you to our website because you may want to visit the gym. You may want to participate in a retreat, which is how I met uh, Pat Bemis. And also Glenn has attended our retreat and been, been our keynote speaker last year. So um, you can ask them for like, what's the, what is it like to go to a week long retreat and exercise four hours a day and do many other fun, wonderful things. So, but this is why I did it because I believed exercise is medicine. I believe that research and um, I wanted to implement it. So first, I just want to make, if anyone is nervous, I want you to know that exercise doesn't have to be like 90% effort and sweating all the time. So, you, you know, you have to start with where you're at. And so any physical activity can be an exercise. So there, the, uh, that you can define a physical activity as anything you do during the day that you use your muscles. And you could be doing very light activity, moderate or vigorous. So you could be uh, working on your computer and kind of fidgeting like I am, moving around, um, moving my feet, standing up and down. Or I could be standing and squatting and moving around the house, vacuuming or cleaning or doing the dishes. Or I could be going outside to do something in the garden um, or just do something recreational that I like, like walking my dogs or doing a walk out in the desert with my poles. So anything you do during the day counts. Um, and uh, exercise, the definition is, it's a, it is a subset of physical activity, but it's very planned, it's intentional, it's repetitive, and the whole goal of exercise is to improve your fitness and your health. So it's something that you just wanna do, like I am gonna go work on that spinning bike. I'm gonna go do a boxing class or a circuit class. Um, so it's, it's more intentional, um, but some people, you don't wanna just jump into exercise. They're not ready for it. They need to first increase their physical activity to the point they want to do more and more. So um, that is officially the definition. So I, the biggest problem is people that die, not just anybody, you know, so many, uh, I think, uh, I don't have the percentages in front of me, but almost no one in the, in the world is actually, is moving enough, right? We spend like 93% of our day, I think it is, at a computer or sitting at a TV or playing with our electronics or whatever. And if you measured your energy levels, if I could put a mask on you and measure your CO2, and I could say, you know what, when you sleep, when you're when you're just sitting around and do and not moving your body during the day, it's just like sleep. You're not using your metabolism hardly at all. You're not you're not using an energy expenditure, and that's what you have to increase. So, um, you can see here on this graph, the person on the left who's sitting has sedentary behavior. Um, sleep and relaxation takes one. Met met metabolic equivalent. That means your energy expenditure is only, let's call it one. If I fidget and move my hands and move around my chair, I might get to 1.5, but that's considered sedentary. If I start to stand and maybe walk to the room, go to the refrigerator and get something um, that you forgot, walk around a little bit, um, even dusting and things you do around the house can be light activity. I'm going to show you a chart. The more you become mobile and move around your space to the point of adding more effort and distance and um, that, you know, you can actually make almost anything vigorous. Um, and so I just wanted you to have that in mind because um, those are, you, you know, you can, your daily life can be more effort. 
And this is just to show you some examples. P there are people in research who have studied almost everything we do in our life and they've measured how much energy we're using when you're dishwashing and ironing and making beds. So they're in the light, that column that says light, and it's less than three mets. That's the measurement for energy expenditure. Is um, they do count? It's better than sedentary. It's actually could add up if you if all day you did these things, these light activities, it could add up. Under moderate, things like vacuuming and sweeping and washing windows, golf, dance, swimming, tennis, um, all of those things start to move up to a higher energy expenditure from three to six. And then you see vigorous, which is um, shoveling, doing hard labor work, right? Also recreational things where you're more fit and maybe you're competing or playing, you're skiing, uh, soccer, swimming, um, like for some competition or setting your pace. So um, people, these are things people choose to do because they want to. They're not doing it for exercise necessarily, but it can be, it can count. So also when you do these kinds of movements in everyday life, it's called skilled complex movement. And we know that Parkinson's, one of the primary uh, deficits is that people lose their ability to perform everyday movements, automatic type of movements, things that you've been doing for so many years, you don't even remember how to do it. You have to think, oh yeah, how do I go and get that out of the cabinet and at the same time I'm doing something else, right? So, um, it's important that you keep this physical activity up because it is complex and it's forcing your brain to do complex movements. And so the exercise program that we've developed really focuses on skilled complex training. And it can be integrated as, 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 you, as you see under vigorous, you can get people to work out at moderate to vigorous levels with skill. So, um, I want you just to know that if you, if all you did is the, if, if your first, if you really decide you want to exercise, the first thing you should do is just move more, more in your everyday life and it's going to help. And then you're ready to start maybe thinking of other goals and things you want to do. So the Parkinson's foundation has now got recommendations for exercise. And I was lucky enough to be involved on this project to develop these guidelines and they're actually being re renewed right now, like updated because the research keeps coming out. But um, what you'll see there is aerobics and strength. Those are the those are exercises where it's, it's really exercise, right? It's, it's goal oriented fitness. Balance, agility, multitasking, Wow, that kind, of, that kind of sounds like everyday life, right? And so you can do it in an exercise class. You can do it in therapy. But it's it that complex training is important no matter where you're doing it. So, um, and of course, your mobility, your stretch, doing stretches, um, which probably there is not a lot of evidence on stretching because you have to do it. It has to be built into your daily life to make it effective, especially with Parkinson's because that rigidity will take away your mobility, your range of motion. And it's the first thing I tell people is you need to stretch every day before you lose that range of motion. And it's really hard for people. So if you like yoga, you need to do something all the time. So if you don't have a stretching program, try yoga classes that are they have yoga classes that specialize in uh, slow stre holding stretches. You don't have to do all the postures and movements um, and or work with your personal trainer or therapist to figure out the types of priorities for stretching you need. So those guidelines are new. They came out like two, two three years ago, I guess. Um, and so now, I'm going to put it back. So now what I want to talk about, and if you all have a question, please type, I, I can stop and answer it. Um, 
because I'm going to kind of go on to the next section and I'm going to talk about, well, wow, what is, what's this, what is this evidence for exercise as medicine? Just the big picture findings. So I'm going to show you some things and explain it. Um, and even today, it, it, it makes me very happy to see this kind of data. Um, so So first, I'm going to talk about something that I know you're probably going to go, oh, there is just no way. So exercise and physical activity, those benefits may prevent Parkinson's disease. They've been looking at this for years, but now they're, they're getting better and better quality data in humans. And what they do is, um, well, first, I'll just tell you what you're looking at. So... Um, this graph is showing you how many people are living with Parkinson's in the blue line. So you can see why the numbers are so big. So there's a, let's say there's 120,000, no, oh, that's actually 1 million, 1.2 million people living with Parkinson's in 2030. And, you, and they've got data on 2010 and 20, and they just sort of have, um, sorry, when I push on the desk, it's, oh, sorry. Well, that's all my slides there. Okay, so the blue line is just showing you um, how many people are living with Parkinson's and then they sort of extend the line and estimate what will it be in 2030. Um, and then they said, well, you know, these are people, they're not, right, these are people that were diagnosed, but what if we could take those people before they're diagnosed when they're healthy? Or maybe they have some genetics and they know what genes they have and they're at high risk because they have certain genetics that put them at high risk. And what if we said to them, we want you to increase your physical activity by 20%. So that would be the red line. And they can estimate if, they know what the numbers are for you know, now, today, and what they will be in 2030. You can estimate that if we had you exercise 20% more, what would those numbers be? How many people would be living with, with Parkinson's? And then they said, what if we had you exercise 80% more, become physical active? And so, um, and they're basing these estimates on real data now that they have where they survey people and they say, okay, um, of all these people, how many, of, what are you doing for exercise? And they do surveys and then they sort of know how, what percentage are doing, let's say I'm a moderate exerciser and I exercise, you know, a six hours of moderate intensity. And then they look and they follow my life and they see, oh, Becky developed Parkinson's like 20 years later. Um, or maybe I don't, but someone else they're comparing me to does. So they're able to come up with these numbers. And it's really amazing um, that if we could just get everybody more active, we would have fewer people living with Parkinson's. And, um, and I'll expand on that a little bit, but this this research is coming from a book that was published recently by three of probably the top, almost the top three movement disorders neurologists in the world, um, Dr. Dorsey, Dr. Okun, Oken, and Dr. Bloom. And um, they published this book, and it, one, it has the best introduction and history of Parkinson's since James Parkinson's that I've ever read. So it's a very good read if you just want to read the first chapter. But then they go into all of the environmental factors that are impacting people who are getting Parkinson's. And they've been able to document how lifestyle, how your activity, your diet, the environments you're living in, can make can cause people to have more Parkinson's. So the prevalence is going up because now they're documenting um, the the more factors, you know, more of these factors that are contributing to the disease. So um, because of this work, and I can't remember the year the book was published, but three to five years ago, they have been able to. Um, 
petition the United States to do more research on these problems. So if you go to their website, it's called Ending PD, you can see they are these doctors and their teams are visiting all of these chemical sites around the world and documenting uh, exposure as well as the number of people around who have been diagnosed. And um, they have developed, a do they did a documentary on all of their results and you can find their data for all these places around you know, the United States and um, wh where those environments are. So they've opened up this, all this information and now there is this huge need to change, um, to get more research and, and make a difference and clean up all those environmental sites. So um, because of their efforts in July of this year, President Biden signed this national plan to end Parkinson's Act into law. So it's not just me who thinks this is amazing. The world is now paying attention to what is causing Parkinson's. What can we do to one, just prevent it to begin with, right? Um, if you go to this link, this is an this video is an APDA, American Parkinson's disease, did a um, educational session about the national plan and what what is it going to do for us and you know as, in terms of uh research money what are they going to do with the money to clean up these sites um and there is an advocacy group it's the largest one i've seen for parkinson's it's called the pd avengers you can join you could get more information um it's just a fantastic um it's mostly people with Parkinson's, but uh, all these people doing this research are in there and they're really working with the government on this whole process of um, making a difference. So that is, um, I hope, interesting and um, you can check more into it at these, these links. And, you know, uh, I can make sure this is a PDF, this file, Kai, if you want, so that you could share it with people. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about prevention. So let's look at, well, what happens? I want you to, I'm going to explain this, but now I want to talk about disease modifying. Let's say if over here on the far left, those healthy people, those preclinical at-risk individuals who's, who have been screened for genetics and they know they have a risk factors for Parkinson's, they don't have Parkinson's yet. Their dopamine neurons are just fine. And so this graph is showing what percentage of dopamine neurons there are. And that's an indicator of disease severity, right? So when those dopamine neurons start to die, um, well, so if you look at the black line, that represents the people that were healthy or preclinical and they were they increased their physical activity and they stayed serious about it. They were lifelong exercisers. And you can see that the black line becomes dashed and they are never they don't get Parkinson's. They might have a little loss in the dopamine neurons, but we know with aging, everyone is losing some percentage of dopamine neurons. So but then you see there's not a D, so they weren't diagnosed yet. So that black line goes on and that's considered to be primary prevention. So those people in the black did not develop Parkinson's. But you look at the blue line and those are the people that were lifelong exercisers, but for some reason, you know, they still developed Parkinson's. But notice that one, they were diagnosed later in life compared to the red group, which I'll talk about. They also, that line is much higher than the red and the green groups. So even though they did get Parkinson's, it's later in life and it's not as severe. Now I want you to look at the red line. These are non-exercisers. No one talked them into exercise before they were diagnosed. And so as they started to lose dopamine neurons, they actually were in that prodromal phase, that early phase of Parkinson's where you, you're not diagnosed yet, but you might have problems sleeping, um, constipation, smell, a lot of other things. And eventually those folks in red were diagnosed. And 
you see that the, the ones that were traditional non-exercisers, their slope is the worst, right? Their symptoms are, well, we're looking at the dopamine neurons right now. So they had the greatest loss in dopamine neurons and um, they were diagnosed earlier than those lifelong exercisers. When you look at the green, these are my favorite because we see them in the gym all the time. They're just diagnosed and they come to the gym and we talk them into being more active. We talk them into exercise, to therapy, to doing more and look at the impact. Their green line, yes, they do have Parkinson's, but it's not too late. They do better over time. They're, the, the, the damage to those dopamine neurons is less. So it's not too late to start exercising at the time of diagnosis. Even later, it's not too late. But if you want to really have an impact on the brain, on protecting those dopamine neurons, the earlier, the better. And um, so I hope that kind of explains, or I really am saying all this to motivate you because this is the kind of information that we tell our clients. And this is what I think really uh, people don't all understand it, right? How strong this evidence is. This, um, these graphs that I'm showing you were just published two months ago. I was working on something else and the paper came out and I just like, oh my gosh, I have to use these everywhere. So these graphs are summarizing in the paper for each of these graphs, they su say supplied the studies underneath them and they summarized the research itself and how it fits into this. So this was a summary of those data. Okay, so that would be, that's what disease modification would look like. They need to have a way to measure the disease, which one way to measure it is the dopamine neurons, how many, how much dopamine are you releasing in your brain? Um, how much, how are, do the dopamine circuits work better? All of those things are ways to image the brain, which people are doing now to show this kind of data. So, um, and then one last thing is maybe you're that green group and red group and you want to, you know, you start exercising later. And so let's now look at your motor symptoms and your non-motor symptoms. And the lines now are at the time of diagnosis. So that little, where they start over there means that people got diagnosed and the regular exercisers, when they were diagnosed, their symptoms, their baseline symptoms, motor and non-motor, are lower or better than the people that were late starters or non-exercisers in the red. So again, it's just saying that it's not too late to start. And when you start, your symptoms are going to be better. And that may be enough to live your life better with less symptoms, even if the disease is still a disease and it's still going on right now, you have a better life, quality of life and reduced disability and all those things. So um, you do better for longer. That's kind of our motto here at the gym. So um, that's my exciting story. I hope that helps give you some hope and motivates you for, um, you know, doing your best because it is the, the good thing about exercise as medicine is you have control of that. You don't need really anybody, but we're a lot of us are here to help you. Um, and that's, and I know that's critical and people, we, we need more access to services and places and education. So my last little here, this is real data. And I want to just, um, as in the data itself, um, but when you start to exercise and you feel better, I don't want you to stop. And this is why. If you look at the graph on the left, these are three groups. The group on the top, they didn't do anything. They just were controls and they did their normal, whatever they wanted to do, but not formal exercise or, you know, structured anything. And so they're 
you're looking at their symptoms. And in this case, the symptoms are getting worse over time. This is six years worth of data. Their symptoms gradually, you know, get worse. I want you to look at the middle group and where the black, the two in black, they went through a five day a week, three week exercise program. And one of them didn't come back. They just went and did their own things. That's the middle group. The other group continued to come back three times a week and do this group exercise program. And this data is six year data. And the red arrow is telling you the people that sustained their practice, they sustained the benefits. Their symptoms continued to look like they did six years ago but they had to keep up that intensity of three times a week. This exercise program was what I would be consider, your heart rate is about moderate and you're doing a lot of skill training. So you're really practicing, you're doing, even they had like a Wii type of games, they had interactive partner activities, it was really fun, but it was very functional. So um, I just want you to know, you can get better and stay better, but you have to keep practicing. So that is our challenge as a healthcare profession. And that's why, again, we have a gym in Tucson where we don't let people stop. As soon as they have an injury or an illness or they stop having success in a class or exercise program, we have them come back to therapy. And we're like, you need to work one-on-one -on -one with me and let's focus on what you want to keep doing so you can, because I know they can get better if we practice it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so that is... And then the, the, the chart on the right is looking at medication levels over six years. And guess what? The group that kept exercising over the course of six years was on less medication than the groups that stopped exercising or never did. So that arrow is telling you this, they were on less. So that's amazing. And just think, if you didn't have to take as many medications, maybe your side effects wouldn't be so bad. Maybe, so, you know, the dyskinesias, that's not been proven yet, but the on-off periods, right? Because you just don't have, you know, your disease might not be quite so severe and your medication needs. So this is why doctors need to see you regularly, but they also, we're only helping them, right? We're sort of saying medications plus exercise and get the right dosage. Um, all right. So you're ready to exercise. Let me see how much time I have. This is my last rules. What did, what should you look for? Well, one, you want to start early and keep it going. It can be exercise. It can be physical activity. It can be rehab. Rehab does both of this. In rehab, we do exercise. We do physical activity, goal oriented task. Um, but your goal should be to put off or reduce those everyday movements, those functional impairments. Um, you want to put off the symptoms, the disability and increase your quality of life. And I know that can happen. These are the four important concepts, aerobic exercise, and I would say strength too, just um, both contribute, have different benefits. Motor cognitive challenge. You need to be not bored. You need, you need variety. You need to be physically challenged and cognitively challenged at the same time, which is kind of an art, but that's what we teach our professionals to do because you don't wanna just be doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, you wanna do intensity, a range of intensity from moderate to vigorous, and you want skill, you want specificity. So you wanna be practicing movements that have some relationship to your daily life. You wanna be practicing cognitive challenges that are like real world challenges. Um, so that these are the things we train and we teach other people how to incorporate. And also you, you wanna be proactive. So if that's the hard thing is to keep people exercising. It's kind of what we specialize in here. We don't have very many people ever sleep, uh, stop unless they move. Um, but uh, you know, if you need help, find rehab and go get one-on-one. -on -one. If you have fear of falling or you certain things are becoming difficult and you can't do the classes or the activities that you want, especially if you're injured or ill, 
people don't realize that if you get injured, your symptoms get worse. If you don't get, if you don't work on them right away, they're going to stay worse. So you really need to, to take the opportunity of when you're sick or injured to go get rehab, go work on practicing again, getting back to your baseline, what it was. You can make improve your baseline. Don't let people make you think, oh, I had an injury. I'm never going to be able to do anything again, or I'm not going to be able to do that again. You can. Um, so, and then I've just listed some activities that are, have been done in research. So if you want some skill-based fitness, you might want to do Nordic walking, brisk walking, like power walking, um, boxing, martial arts, dance, pet, spinning on a bike, treadmill, anything. Treadmill's great if you can do it um, and your balance isn't an issue, but you can hold on and do treadmill. Lots of leisure activities like ping pong, pickleball, badminton, eye-hand coordination. You need the, that, that practice. It's fun and social. And then any kind of games, those are like skill-based activities. If you wanna do, um, we also know that wellness is important, right? This idea is not just about exercise, it's about your diet, it's about your stress levels, your sleep. So you really should look at these other kinds of mind-body activities. And there's a whole lot of lists. I don't have to tell you, it's not what I think is the best. It's really what you, you can get and find and like. So even writing and arts and crafts are so important to do stuff you like to keep yourself engaged cognitively and even fine motor and all these things. Um, and I'm going to summarize this gym members exercise prescription. He's somebody that comes here, Chris, um, and I'm going to show you how he put it together. This is this will be overwhelming. The first one. This is what it looks like. I'm going to tell you how it got there. So let's just take a calendar. You could do this every day, your hours during the day when you maybe would be active. And the first thing he did was something on his patio with an app on his phone. And he just would spin on a bicycle just to wake up and get moving. So that was his first thing. Over time, he starts to add more and more to his picture. He likes to hike. So his wife and them decided, let's just go on our favorite outdoor activity and hike once a week on Sunday morning. And then his wife works out at this place, I you'll see. And he decided to start doing some resistance training because she was there anyway, and it was for 30 minutes. So he started doing strength training. And then he added, his, his wife was taking all these other classes. So he started adding other classes. And so these are just 30 minute variety of fun things, different things. Maybe not fun to you, but but things, <laughs> activities. Then he signed up for our power gym. And we so happened to have like a martial arts and a high intensity classes going on in Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we filled in Tuesday and Thursday for him. And he met a bunch of other people who were his peers. More Those other classes were uh, in the, like at a public gym. So there weren't people with Parkinson's at the nifty stretch or balance. But at our gym, he gets to have all his buddies or friends and uh, interact with them on Tuesdays and Thursdays. He then decided um, he'd try a spin, an official spin class, because he does like cycling. So he's, he signed up for a YMCA spinning class, which was a lot more, um, is an hour, so it's a little bit more challenge. So now he's got some pretty high intensity stuff going on as well as low, lower or moderate, a whole variety of activities. He then added in that light blue, the breath. And I think this is funny because I think he realized he needed to spend more time where, like being calm, breathing, meditating a little bit, finding time for himself after all this exercise. So he added some he uh, took a course and he met someone in his classes who does meditation and he learned some breathing activities. So he incorporated that into his plan. We're almost done. And then he, um, what did he add next? Uh, 
see, it didn't move. Oh, then he added a little, he calls it a sunset walk because he, he read something about how being outdoors is so important and kind of enjoying the moment, being in the moment, right? So again, he had, it was sort of a mindful activity that he does in the evening and he probably includes his breathing in that whole, F, that whole activity. Um, and then if he wanted you to see you know, then you have to work your medications around all that. You're, you're eating, you got to eat a lot more or at least make sure you eat. So he waited and had breakfast. He did all his exercise stuff in the morning and then he had a nice meal. Um, and then at dinner, um, you know, it was sort of his end of the day. So it could be another mindful activity. So that the last thing that he added, we ju we just started to do ping pong at the gym, and it's our. I tell you, it's the most important, the most popular thing we have going on right now. Um, people they wait. We have three tables that are full and they're rotating. So he does that because he just loves hanging out and playing ping pong. So it's just like a party, like you know. And those are the days that we have it. So he is here sometimes multiple days a week doing uh, all these activities. So. Not that you have to do that much, but I wanted you to see how it doesn't have to be instant, right? It's over time. All right. And then he adds up on the bottom. This is kind of his reward. He adds up basically how many minutes and hours he spends doing high intensity, kind of moderate intensity skill training, resistance, walking. And so it just, I'm sure it gives him a lot of reward. And, you know, makes your brain, makes you feel good when you feel rewarded and then you spit out a little extra dopamine to sort of give you the, um, the congratulations for all your hard work. So, all right. I don't see questions. I was hoping you might have questions. This is just something uh, I put up here about um, when you are exercising and you want to know, well, is this for me? Is this class good for me? There's a lot of things you can ask yourself. And if it, if not, find another class, find another instructor. Um, so this will be in my notes. I don't have to say all this, but it's important that you, you know, you, uh, you take some time sometimes. You don't, you want to make sure that you're doing things where you feel challenged and rewarded, where you're working and don't just work in the same position all the time. Get on the floor in a chair and standing and moving in different environments um moving different directions and if you miss your classes you ought to kind of notice it like in the next week or so you're going to be like how oh, i've missed i missed a whole week of classes and i'm not feeling so good that's telling you that exercise is doing something so all right um do you have questions do you have anything do you have anything? I, I have a question Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Jack. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Jack, and I'm a big fan of uh, all the stuff that you you're uh, talking about here. And I want to thank you for training Glenn, who's made me a fan. Um, I was diagnosed four years ago, and uh, what I find most frustrating now is, uh, or or not most fussy, but somewhat frustrating, is uh, my small motor skills. Some of my small motor skills have deteriorated. And you mentioned fine motor skills in your talk. Uh, and so things like uh, tying my shoes and buttoning shirts and putting on my pants even, uh, writing in, in particular, and sometimes at the computer, uh, controlling controlling the keys, a bit frustrating. So I'm wondering to what ex what is there for um, for me to help me keep my small motor skills or improve my small motor skills while still doing P PWR, big big moves sort of thing. Yeah, awesome question. Awesome There's question. Um, oops, sorry, echoing. Yeah, okay, thanks. So I'm so glad you asked that. There is so much evidence on training the upper limbs and dexterity for everyday life. So using a computer, buttoning, opening things, all the stuff you said, Jack. So 
you can, and it should be a daily part. In fact, when people come to our gym, one of the first things we give them is a hand exercise protocol, like a whole bunch of choices. We even have videos, uh, even our virtual experience has videos of hand exercises. So you want to practice, right, overcoming these small hands, because in Parkinson's, the hands kind of uh, round and close. And even when you're moving big, your hands don't always activate and you want to open them, right? You want to include your hands no matter what you're, if I'm reaching up high or throwing something, I want to exaggerate my hands. But you can also do specific exercises. So have a little container and put in a lot of different things that you want to be able to manipulate. Um, plastic containers, things that are small so you can work all of this. And then I'm going to show you some exercises and then pick those things up every day or every other day. Go and practice manipulating tools and objects that you have to move with your hands and your fingers. So as an exercise for fingers, here's the one you want to open. You want to open and keep your arms big because you'll get more effort and more sort of active stretch and open wide. And um, then you want to work them individually. So I like to do it this way. I like to clasp my hands and open. I want to open my index fingers, close, open my middle fingers, close. And you'll get better at this. It is so hard to isolate fingers and the little fingers, but simple. These are kind of exercises musicians do, guitar players. You can find pictures of those things. If you look kind of for guitar exercises, you might find some of those. You want to practice making round circles, but I mean intentionally pushing hard, keeping a circle with each of your fingers and opening them all the way. Down, close, open. Make your circle and pin, pinch it together and open. So I would put the same effort, Jack, into a little set of exercises for you. And then you need to have a few objects to manipulate. Like I like to use nuts and bolts and you have to do them fast, right? But big and really don't get little, don't make it small where you're you're sitting here and, and changing your posture. Stay up with your posture and, op and use your hands for things like that and it's just some of it is just an awareness right keeping your awareness of what does it feel like to use my hands through all that range of motion and then of course stretching but um i like active stretch so um so glenn can make you a set of hand exercises um and some like a, we usually have a hand station you might have glenn already in your setup but a hand station where you go over and you practice those kind of manipulative activities. So I know I hate to tell you you have to you have to work more, but it will it will work. There is research that people their handwriting improves, their their ability to manipulate objects improves. So it's kind of like a use it and lose it. But don't let it frustrate you. It's just like um, if there's something you really do like to do, like working with tools and stuff, you might want to. Think about that because you could into you could integrate those movements into your exercise, and it doesn't take long. I mean, your hands you only need like five or ten minutes of just rehearsing all of these things, um, and so great. Anybody else? That's a great answer, Doctor Farley. I have a question. We frequently see people who are diagnosed with Parkinson's. And it's hard enough if you're hard a enough. lifelong or exerciser lifelong to continue exercising when you have Parkinson's, but it's especially hard for people who are non-exercisers. Um, what we see um, sometimes is they some jump into crazy. exercise, exercise, they kind of push hard, push hard, and then they get discouraged. And so it's, and the things that you mentioned are great with lifestyle and activity, is there kind of a general path that can help non-exercisers get going? Does that make sense? Yeah, great question, Kai. Um, yes, non-exercisers, it is a challenge, but you know what? That's 
it's like kind of think of it as exploring activities. I think people need to try just different things. No commitment. Try these things. Um, also finding friends who might go with them because they maybe they both want to try things together and one has a little more experience, a family member that wants to work out with them some, because it's almost like you have to get to a certain threshold. Like, let's say you do it for a month or two months and all at once they start, oh, I want to go to the gym because I want, um, they don't have to become exercisers. They just have to go. Like, because some people come to our classes and the reason they're there is because their friends are there. They don't really, and they may not put as much effort into everything, right? They may, just because some people, their sense of their, their effort is not as vigorous, right? They just don't, you, it's hard, but I, I like to do things like, for instance, if they don't call it exercise, right? Maybe just sort of get them into some kind of activities that they choose. Just like, maybe it's going to the botanical gardens and just walking, um, maybe it's going to a flea market, you know, doing things that are more and more active and then helping them to maybe go to their first class, um, like, and do something like spinning, not treadmill, something that's not too hard from a fall risk or fear, or you could spin at your own rate and, you know, nobody's watching you kind of thing. It's you, you choose your effort, your cadence. Um, or maybe they prefer to um, throw the ball with their grandsons, right? And do, so I think a lot of it is sort of working with people on, okay, like when I see them at the gym, I would say, tell me the things you like to do already. Like, let's see if we can build on what you already like. And then maybe tease in like one or two other things. Like let's try some hand exercises because maybe they like to sew and cook and, you know, do things like that, care for others. So they really need to have good hand control. So in like Jack said, for them, that might be the priority. I want to really, I'll, I'll spend time during the day working on my hand exercises. And then when they realize their hands are better, they're more likely to try a different class, maybe a Tai Chi class or so. Um, uh, it is a challenge. And um, and that's another reason for rehab, because I think we see that all the time. We're used to dealing with it and we can kind of figure out a personal prescription and then they can go try it and work with Glenn and all these people in the community to try and, you know, then they come back and we say, how's it going? So. That's a good answer. Thank you. I think a lot of people try one or two things and then get discouraged, but I like your try a lot of activities and see what you gravitate towards. Yeah, they should, yeah. they could go on a, um, you know, basically visit different classes. You know, we mm -hmm. even have people observe if they want to. Um, I'd rather them sit in it and kind of have to do some of the things, but some people just want to come observe the class and decide if that's something they like. So great. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question for Dr. Farley? Okay. Do we have, are we, we're over time, but Dr. Farley, do you have any um, quick exercises that you want to I might just not do them. I, I'm, I see Glenn over there setting up in his gym. I told okay. him we should do a demo, but no, I think that um, that it was good. I rather have had the discussion. So, um, okay. But people, I do hope you will visit. Um, we do have some virtual videos that people can do exercises for hands and all, their whole body strength and things. And if you're interested in our retreat, talk to Glenn, talk to Pat, talk to Lori. Um, and if you want more information, you're free to, um, I don't have it up there, but if you just email us at info at Power for Life, it will get to me or someone and we can, you know, help with any questions. So, but, and uh, you do have a, a online um, membership for people in, in Hawaii, if yeah, they just so, go to that same website. Yeah, you can check it out. It's called the virtual experience and um 
it's a separate web. It will send you to a separate website with memberships, but it will give you like a sample class and things, different kinds of classes. Some people just do a package. Like if you really are interested in hands, Jack, you could just get a package and that's all you purchase and you have a set of videos for your hands. So definitely check it out. There might be some things that people could do. Great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. My pleasure. I enjoyed it, everybody. Thanks for the time. And um, just be active. Keep active. And you got good people there. I hope to visit sometime the gym with Glenn and maybe do a workshop and some uh, get to see it. So next time. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Farley, for joining us today. It was very informative. Thank you. Very motivational. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Becky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.